We're going we're gonna to jump into a two-part series today. Uh, and actually, I'm trailing off the heels of last week's message. If you missed last week's, go online and, and uh, get a chance to listen to it. And uh, we're kind of leading right into this one from last week, same text there for a minute. Uh, but before we do that, the, the title of this series, it's only a two-part series, but it's very powerful. A uh, lot, of, lot of spiritual thought process time for me going into these two messages. And to know your purpose. One thing I've realized in 15 years of ministry, many people who call themselves to be Christians have no idea what that means. They, they don't even really know what that means to be a Christian, so they don't know their purpose. They don't know their identity. Who am I? I'm, I'm calling myself a Christian, but I don't know my purpose. So we're going to talk about that over the next two weeks. But before we do that today, because we struggle with our purpose, look at that person sitting next to you and tell them, I'm taking you out for dinner today. I'm taking you out for dinner today. Some of you didn't even look at your spouse. Did you talk on the way to church today? Knowing your purpose. Matthew chapter 13, 24. Take your Bible and turn there. I'm going to just read two verses out of last week's text. Today we're going to talk about your identity. And when you take that person that you told out for lunch today, maybe you can talk to them about your identity. Identity is an interesting thing. Sometimes in marriage, the person that you're married to takes on your identity, or vice versa. And they lose their identity, which is sometimes very bad. So identity. But before we can get into the bowels of identity, Matthew 13, 24, he put another parable before them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. We're talking about kingdom. We're talking about kingdom here. Kingdom is about believers. This is not a verse to non-believers. This is a verse to believing people. Kingdom theology. Kingdom news. Kingdom information. Now, who's in the kingdom? What adjective does he use to explain the seed? The king is going to put what kind of people into his kingdom? Good people, good seed. But we can take it the next step further. It's more than good here. It's born-again believers, right? So he's going to put born-again believers into his kingdom. So this is about his kingdom, and his kingdom consists of good seed. Last week we talked about good seed. Can a corn kernel turn into a soybean kernel? No. Can a wheat kernel turn into a cockaburr? No, it can't transition and come into bad or bad come into good. The kingdom exists with good seed. Now, the good seed are people where the seed has been planted into you by God. That makes you good. So if you're good this morning, you can say, I'm good. You're good seed. Why do you struggle with that? We're going to look at that this morning. Not only good seed, but then jumping way down to verse number 43 at the end of these parables, he says this. Th this good seed, these people, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. Man, I mean, I go to bed at night dreaming about this. I mean, as Christians, this is what we think about? There will come a day when I shine like the righteous which I am today because I'm clothed with the robe of righteousness. I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and I'm going to shine like the sun in the kingdom. Hallelujah. That's, that's what he's saying. This is who we will be. He who has an ear, let him hear this information. Good seed. And if God has transformed you, you're a born-again believer, you're good. Last week I did two nursing home, two nursing home funerals, two nursing home services. And I explained this, and I ended it, and I never seen a room full of elderly people, wheelchairs and oxygen, and all sorts of things just light up. And this is how I ended it. I said, every one of you sitting here today who confess to believe in Jesus has value. You have value beyond your understanding. You're not an insignificant person just wasting your years sitting here in a nursing home in a wheelchair. You have value, you have purpose, and you are significant. God loves you. Man, they were just like, wow. But we need to hear that. 
we need to hear that we are valued. So, 1 Corinthians 13.10. We're going to marry these, marry these two texts together today. Paul does a like kind theology here. We're talking about good seed. Kingdom people. Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. I spoke, I thought, I reasoned. How do children speak, think, and reason? Not very well. You ever see two kids fight over a ball? Yeah, I mean, it takes like 30 seconds or 15 seconds. One grabs it, the other one punches them. I mean, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. And you don't have to tell your children to lie. You don't have to tell your children how to steal. I mean, you ever wonder, born into total depravity, we're born into sin, we're, we're broken. And Paul says, when I was like that, I did all the things like a child. When I came, when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Good seed, kingdom people, born-again believers, have transitioned from childhood ways to mature ways. Paul's not talking about gender here. He's talking about maturity. He's talking about how you act. I just want to touch on the base, give you a couple pointers today, the barriers that stop us from acting in maturity like Paul's talking about here. What is in your way of reaching your understanding of your identity? What's stopping you from getting it? I got a couple pictures for you this morning. What's in your way? You ever drive down a road and see a, a barrier sign? I mean, it's mainly don't go there. I go around them sometimes and still go down that road. But what, what's in your way? What barrier is stopping you from you understanding your identity? Now, in that text, I didn't read the whole thing to you. He says the good seed and the weeds grow up together. We have to coexist in this world with weeds. So what is your barrier from being the wheat weed to produce the fruit in the kingdom that God has called you to be that's stopping you from being that? I didn't have a magnet strong enough this morning, but I wanted to use a magnet illustration. Imag imagine God being this massive magnet. And we're a piece of iron out here. And in the gravitational system, what goes up must come down. So we're being pulled down by the natural forces of the world, but along comes God for the good seed, the born-again believer, and it's like he's pulling at your core. And if, if you can just imagine God as a magnet, he's pulling you, and you feel that through the work of the Holy Spirit. You feel like, whoa. I mean, when you read his word, or you're just like, wow, you're here because you've pulled here today. This goes against the flesh. Your natural order would be to stay home. Are the Vikings playing today? Your natural order would be pre-prep game, whatever you do. Pre-prep. <laughs> pre Pre-game. Goes against your grain to be here. That is what I'm saying. It didn't quite come out that way. But you're being pulled, right? I mean, you, you, you were drawn into worship today. We're drawn into worship through music. We're drawn into the Word through the Holy Spirit. He pulls us. Now, let me ask you this. If we coexist with weeds and wheat and we're good seed, does he pull the weeds along? He doesn't. God doesn't want the junk in you. So when he pulls you along, and it's like this magnet drawing you into him, is he going to draw the junk? No. He's only going to draw the good into him because you are to be more Christ-like. So your first one is you're being drawn. Your first takeaway today, if you're a note taker, stop looking at the weeds. Stop looking at the weeds. I was in agriculture for 22 years. I'm still very involved with it. We, lived in an we live in an agricultural community. And all of you sitting here today, whether or not you've ever sat in a tractor or drove one or a combine or anything like that, know full well when you drive down the road and you look at a field if there's weeds out there. Don't you? You know, oh, that field looks terrible. Wonder who the farm's at. I mean, that's what we say. But God says you're going to coexist with the weeds. So, as you go through life, 
you're a born-again believer. You're a good seed, right? You have value. The, the owner planted you, prepared a field because you're so valuable. He's not going to pull the weeds with you. So why do you continue to look at them? You're looking at the weeds and saying, I wish my marriage was like that marriage. I wish my kids would act like their kids. And all the time he says, look to Jesus. Look to the one who planted you. Look to the one who born you. Look to the one who you are producing fruit for. Look to Jesus. Stop looking at the weeds. All of us look at weeds at some time in our life. But he says, no. No, I'm going to let you grow up together and just stay focused on me. Your second one, stop acting like a weed. What does that mean? When you live in an environment with the same people, like I said last week, be careful who you run with. Because they'll have influence on you. And eventually, if you start look at the weeds and act like the weeds, they will smother over you. You're still a wheat crop trying to produce into a wonderful harvest, but you're being smothered. Because you're acting like them. Don't look at the weeds and don't act like the weeds. Many people miss their opportunity because they lack the patience to go through the process to become the seed that they were called to be because they're looking and acting like the weeds. I got married too soon. Did you? Had kids too early. We've all heard these excuses. My parents did this to me. My parents didn't let me play basketball. My employer, my boss is a jerk. And it, it's only when we stop acting and looking like the weeds and we can self-reflect and we can say, God, thank you for taking me through that process. Thank God I got kicked out of a church. Thank God I got fired. Thank God I have a different job. Thank God I rented another farm. Thank God for the process because if you don't go through it, you can't have it. Let me say that again. If you don't go through it, you can't have it because you don't get it. Because you're still focusing and looking like the weeds and acting like the weeds. So look to Jesus. Act like Jesus. Nothing you went through was wasted. Nothing you have been through was ever wasted in God's economy. He will use it to mature you. You put down more roots. You become stronger. You become healthier to produce the grain that he's called you to be. We all need the blood of Jesus. Adam did something very bad. And what did he do? He went and hid. His thought process took him that he was no longer any good, so he went and hid, and God says, Adam, where are you? He had to get his focus back on the one who planted him, the one who started the whole process. Your third one this morning, delete all thoughts that are from the weeds. You ever have a thought from a weed that gets in your head? Yeah, they're terrible. You know, somebody just says sometimes it's just a bad day. Maybe you woke up a little stagnated. It just ain't going, and you're kind of just like... And then somebody puts a zinger in there, and it's like... Pfft. All of a sudden, I have no value. I have no worth. Everything's bad. Everything's wrong. It's because the thought of that weed got in your head, so we look to Jesus, we act like Jesus, and we think like Jesus. Jesus did not have those days. You know why? It's because he was in communion with the Father. Constant communication with the Father. Constantly being told, you are my son. You have a purpose. We have a plan. And the same thing for you and for I. So when, when we, we start looking at this worldly things, and we try to become part of the world, we go to the clothing store and we look at a mannequin. I learned this from a guy, by the way. I said, how do you always dress like that? He says, I just buy what's on the mannequin. I was like, oh, what an excellent idea. Yeah, you've done that before, haven't you? He's like, yeah, that's what you do. Buy what's on the mannequin. The only problem we have is we want to look and be like the mannequin because it's probably a weed and we want to be like that person. And guess what? It doesn't fit. Everything I go into a men's clothing store most time and buy, like the cool stuff, you know, it's up here and up here. Only comes in a 42 chest with a 25 sleeve length. I'm like, really? You can't look at the weeds in a mannequin and expect to be like them. You look to Jesus. He is the one we draw our strength, our source from. Not all this worldly stuff. It takes work. 
it takes work. But you've got to remember that you were planted, you're good, and your identity is where God assumes the responsibility not only for drawing you into him, but he sets the elements around you. I've prayed about that one a lot. Let me read that again. Your identity is when you understand that God assumes the responsibility for not only drawing you into him, but he sets the environment around you. You're a born-again believer. You're good seed. He planted you in a field that he prepared for you. He knows the plans he has for you. You can trust the environment that he has you in. You can trust it. I have to trust that this is the environment that God has me in. Because it's his plan. It's his deal. When you go to the restaurant and you order a plate of food, who pays for it? You do. You ordered it. If God ordered the church, if God orders my life, who, who's going to see it through? He will. Because I constantly stay focused on him, look to him, act like him, think like him, delete the thoughts that are from the weeds so I start to live like him. That's what he wants. There's one more conundrum here. There's, there, there's one more issue here. and th here's, here's your breakthrough for your barriers, your barriers that we're talking about is when you don't know your identity and you start to look to weeds, act like weeds, think like weeds, and you don't have your identity right, I can tell that person right away in a conversation. Or I can tell them really relatively fast if I have to work with them. Here's how it works. If the person doesn't perform in their job and I have to correct them or you have to correct them, on their job, and you correct them on their job, and they take it personally, and they think you're attacking them personally. Right? And instead of being able to differentiate the difference between being corrected on what I did and who I am, they take it as a personal attack, and they get offended. I wasn't attacking you personally, or whoever the conversation is. I was correcting you on your actions. But when a person is not comfortable with their identity, any sort of correction that comes their way, they take it personal and they think you're correcting them on their person. Man, a living, and if I have heard one time from this younger generation, and I'm not banging around on the younger generation, I love you all, but they say, you're judging me. No, I'm not judging you. I'm just trying to help you. I want to help you succeed. I want to help you see that, you know, you did this a little bit wrong. But they take it personally. And when you're not comfortable in your identity, that person is tough to deal with. Turn to the person next to you and say, I don't like your hairdo. I don't like your shoes. Some of you can't even do that. I don't like your dress. I don't, oh, nobody has a dress on here today, do they? I don't like your shirt. See, and when we do that, oh, what doesn't he like about me? It isn't anything to do with you. I just don't like well, your hair. I don't like your job performance. See what I'm saying? But when you're concrete in your identity and who you are in Christ, somebody can say to you, you know what? And especially in marriages is where this comes full circles. You know what? I just really don't like your hairdo, honey. And, you know, runs away balling. No, it's like, you know what, I'll change it next time. I like it. And when you're comfortable in who you are, there's the difference. And those people will invite the conversation, and this is what they should say, and a lot of times they do say, you know what, tell me more. What did I do wrong? I want to know how to do this job better. And I want you to help me because you were able to see it in me that I wasn't doing it. Those are the people you want to run with. Those are the people you want to be around. Those are the people who God says, you're good seed, so when you know your identity, you can take the criticism towards your performance, not who, who you are. And I pray to God, if I'm ever singing out a storm in the shower, Ginger says, honey, you can't sing. <laughs> and I'll say, thank you, because I was about ready to sing it out in church. Right? I mean, you, you take that in and say, thank you, not, oh, they don't like me anymore. Identity. Know your identity in Christ. 
And once you know your identity in Christ, you're a firm foundation because you're good seed, you have value, you know who you are, and it isn't based on your performance. And here's what we do in today's world. This is their job. And now you're a volleyball player or whatever the ball will make her to do. You don't have to be afraid of the ball. It's not going to blow up or anything. Just hang on to it. <laughs> so now I'm viewing her as a person that can perform with that ball, whatever it is. And she's doing a really good job, but she made a mistake. So then I take the ball from her, and now she's crushed. <laughs> he was crushed too if her identity is in what she was doing with this she was never secure in who she was but if her identity is secure in who she is I can take the ball from her and she's like oh Pastor Lynn teach me something else to do because I evidently wasn't doing that right or if I give you two balls and I give you two balls for a year but next year I take one ball away still doesn't change who she is and I think we should start this with anybody who comes into leadership. We give them a ball. This is your ball for a year, and if I take this ball away from you, I don't want to hear any whining about it. Because that's what we do. You follow me, and I'm helping you on identity. We put our identity in what we do instead of who we are. And once we do that, it's dangerous. But once we become secure in who we are, know that we are a child of God, born into the kingdom, into good seed, you can tell me what's wrong with me. I'll listen to you. And I should be able to tell you what's wrong with you. The other thing that, that happens here is that we think we should be like somebody else. How many times have you said, I wish I was like that guy? I wish my marriage was like theirs. Well, go home with them once. I mean, nothing is the way it seems. Accept the way God made you. Have you ever said, what were you thinking, God, when you made me? Nobody's ever said that? Am I the only crazy person here? You've got to be able to accept who you are. Because God knows who you are. Look at Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I know the thoughts that I think toward you. That's just awesome. God says, I know what I think about you. I know what I think about uh, toward you, says the Lord. Here it is. Thoughts of peace, not evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's what God thinks about you all the time. So why in the world are you wandering around this world hopeless, wondering who I am, taking criticism for nothing that you should even be, it's just job performance, and accept the fact that God made you a specific way, he has a plan and a purpose, and he thinks about you. You know how wonderful it is to know, come home at an end of a day, that Ginger has been thinking about me? Some of you maybe too. It's cool to think that someone's thinking about me. But we can take it to the next realm to think that God is thinking about me and my life. So you can go through the day thinking, you know what, this is a little bit of a bumpy day. But God's thinking about me. God knows me. Like we read this morning in prayer, Isaiah says, I've carved your name into my hand. I got a picture for you on this. Can you break through this? Can you break through this? Yes, all you have to do can you break through this picture, is identify that you're a good seed. We can break through this. Accept who you are. You ever wonder why God made you the way you did? You know, when we had kids, I was in awe over her. I mean, guys, how many guys, come on, Guys, we're in awe over women when it comes to kids. Number one, just to birth them. Oof, glad I didn't have to do that. I mean, that, that's awe. If any of you were in the room, it's crazy. You know, but they're, they're built 
They're designed by the hand of God where he's thinking about a woman, and I'm just using a woman this morning uh, for my illustration, and, and you can trust that. You know, when our kids were little, I'd come in the house and Ginger's like, oh, I've been holding on to Carrie. It was colicky. She couldn't drink milk. She cried all the time. And, you know, and she's walking around with Carrie here. And, she, you know, hands are off to me. And she's like, just slides down, you know. And it's like, how did she carry her all day? You know, I mean, my arm would cramp up and hurt. So I would carry the kids like on my hip. I would just take my hand and just hold them against my side and just walk around with them here. But a woman, she can, you know, they got that, hip, <laughs> shelf. I'm not saying anything bad about you girls. That's the way God made you, right? And accept that. She could walk around with one of the girls on her hip all day. Man, my arm was like shot after two minutes. I hear have her back. Accept who you are. Accept the fact, ladies, that your man is designed in such a way we can work 14 hours a day. We're, we're muscular, structural, different than a woman. And guys, if your wife is working 14 hours a day chopping, <laughs> chopping wood, you probably shouldn't have her do that. <laughs> She's not designed for that. We're, we're designed and created by God who thinks about us for specific purposes and tasks. Accept your identity and who you are. Can we break through? Yes, we can, because we know that God has a plan for us. He thinks about us. The breakthrough. Breakthrough. Here's your breakthrough. I'm just going to leave you with one point today. You have to accept the fact that you are progress in action. You never arrive. You're never just going to wake up one morning and just be perfect. You are progress in action. And once you realize your identity, once you realize who you are in Christ, and once you realize that God is molding you, forming you, taking you on a road, down a road for a process, you can trust him. You can trust God because he thinks, he knows, he has your plan and your purpose all in his overarching sovereign will. How many of you, just right now, don't raise your hand, have struggled with your identity? Why am I here? Why did I get married? Why did I have kids? Why did I go to school? Identity is big. But I can guarantee you today that you can break through, you can accept that you're a progress in action, and you can end better than the way you started because once you get it, you got it, and once you realize God is God and he has formed you, you're good seed, he's placed you in a place, you can redevelop the way you start to think. We look to Jesus, we act like Jesus, we think like Jesus, and we hear the very words that you are good. At the end of the day, you are good. How does it happen? Isaiah 55, 9 through 12. I want you to leave today with the tool to know that these barriers can be gone. And here's the tool. Isaiah writes, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. So God is saying there's a separation here. I'm up here, my thoughts, me are here, and you are here. There's, there's a separation. But then he explains it. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and they do not return there, but they water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving what? Seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Verse number 11. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. There's your breakthrough. The word that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Jeremiah says God's thinking about you. He's sending the rain. He's sending the word. It's not going to return void. It's going to do what I sent it for. Verse number 12, for you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace and the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. Who? You ever walk through a valley and realize that the mountains are singing because you're there? That is crazy. 
and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. <laughs> Let me just give you the, the illustration here in verse number 11. So shall my word be that it goes out from my mouth, and it will not return empty and void. The word is the rain. The rain comes down to water, to supply, to grow, to nourish, to do a job. And he says that rain that touches that seed will sprout and grow. And it will not return to me void. And then he uses the illustration. He says it's the word. So the word comes down. The word rains. We take it in to nurture us, to grow us, to give us a strong identity, to understand who he is. Some of you got an umbrella over your head. If it can't get in, it can't do its job. We love to come to church. We love to, to sing. But if it can't get in, it can't nurture and do its job. Hence the reason it's so important to spend time in the Word. Because the Word rains down and the Word brings life. So because the Word is the rain that gets in and produces, what are you producing? And if you don't know your identity, you might be stagnated. And if you're sitting here today with an umbrella, let God just take it out. Sometimes we do that. And we, we think we're this, we're this crazy Christian, but it can't get in. Because you're looking and acting and thinking like the weeds. You can teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. You can teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. That word, that rain, just fell. You have asked me to be a preacher, teacher, and a shepherd, co-shepherd at best. Presenting the word, which is the rain, that comes down to get in the heart. Now Sunday morning, you come into the fellowship here, into the worship time to get fed. And to receive. But what do you do during the week? Because you constantly need to be nurtured, watered, fed. And when that word gets in, you produce. The word is the rain. And you got to sit in the rain this morning. I think that's awesome. And when you spend time in the word of God and you open it, that, that's, the, that's the rain coming in. How many of you ever just went out in the rain and just walked? I think it's awesome. I mean, to the point where the underwear, the socks are soaked. And you're just in the rain. You used to do that on the farm, have to go down, check the well, check the cows, whatever. And it's like, okay, I'm going to get wet. I mean, I'm really going to get wet. But then after you're all wet, it's like, this ain't so bad. Everything's soggy now anyway. And you can just be. I'm challenging you today that as you understand your identity in Christ, to let that word saturate you. And just be in the presence of God. And get the focus off the weeds. Stop looking to him, thinking like him. But put all your focus on Jesus because he's the fruit. He's the one that's going to have you produce a harvest like you can only imagine. Because he says, I'm thinking about you. I know the plans I have for you. And I want to rain down on you. So as you come to communion today, envision that soaking. You just sat in the presence of the Holy Spirit through the Word. And it fills, it touches, it changes. And that's awesome. It's an awesome place to live. It's an awesome place to be. And you can leave here today saying, I'm a child of the King.